virus. However, these investigations, as you'll understand, are ongoing, and as soon as the facts are available, we'll put them in the public domain. Thank you. We now move directly to the next item of business, which is a statement by Alex Salmond, the First Minister of Scotland. Uh, signing off, sir. Uh, firstly, uh, I have to, and uh, not for the first time in this chamber, disappoint Willie Rennie. Uh, I took it from uh, his question at First Minister's Questions last Thursday that he was making a very subtle last-ditch attempt to persuade me to stay in post. <laughs> uh, I have given his suggestion great thought, but I have decided to resign anyway at the start of parliamentary business tomorrow. This notice should allow Mr Rennie ample time to secure his nominations to have a tilt at the job. <laughs> I, I assure him if he so decides, then I will weigh up his candidacy with great care, uh, before casting my vote for my friend and colleague, Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Presenting officer, there are now only a minority of members here today who, like you and I, uh, attended the opening ceremony of this reconvened parliament in 1999. It was a, a great day. We heard moving poetry. Uh, the late Donald Dewar gave the finest speech of his life. And when Sheena Wellington sang A Man's A Man, the entire chamber joined in the final verse. However, one other thing struck me about that day was that when the MSPs entered the General Assembly building on the mound, we were cheered in by the public. I had never seen that level of public engagement in politics before, and until this last summer, I had never seen it since. The public enthusiasm on that first day it was an inspiration, but, but also a challenge. It was Eddie Morgan who captured the mood perfectly five years later in the poem to mark the opening of this Parliament building. We give you our consent to govern. Don't pocket it and ride away. We give you our dearest wish to govern well. Don't say we have no mandate to be so bold. My view is that, on the whole, this Parliament has fulfilled the public wishes and earned their consent. We have accepted the mandate to be bold. Our composition now reflects much of the diversity of modern Scotland. We have become the chief hub of national discourse and debate, the fulcrum of Scottish public life, the chamber which people expect to reflect their priorities, their values and their hopes. Now, that is not because of any one political party. It is because of the commitment of so many of the, the members over the last 15 years. Uh, I think in particular of some of the MSPs who are no longer with us. Donald Dewar, Margaret Ewing, Bashir Ahmed, Phil Galley, Donald Gorey, David McCletchie, Brian Adam, Helen Eady, John Farkham and Rowe, Sam Galbraith, and of course the truly remarkable Margaret MacDonald. Uh, this Parliament's uh, Proceedings are, are not perfect. How on earth could they be? We're not actually 15 years old, we're 15 years young. Uh, and you, presiding officer, have implemented significant improvements. But this Parliament has great strengths, and we should never underplay them. <clears throat> uh, the last speech I, I made in this chamber it was at the Business in Parliament conference, where 100 businesses and representatives were we are sitting in the chamber here uh, alongside six ministers, 17 MSPs and people from the third sector and from the wider public sector. Last year, more than 400 different organisations held events in this building. Overall, in 15 years, we have welcomed more than 4 million visitors. Now, that degree of uh, accessibility is not unique in the democratic world, but it is uh, very rare and pretty impressive. Throughout my time as First Minister, I have tried to reflect that and approach the Government to our key social partners. Last week, the STUC made exactly that point at our regular meetings between Government and General Counsel. Presenting officer, I have led a minority administration and a majority one. Minority Government requires negotiation to recognise honest disagreement and then compromise in the public interest. And, presiding officer, I have absolutely no idea if my experience of minority government in this place will ever come in handy in another place. <laughs> Interestingly, when we had a minority government, the SNP was on the, the side of the majority 
for 80 per cent of the votes in this chamber. There were hardly any occasions where all of the other parties uh, lined up against us. Uh, mind you, there was that small matter of the Edinburgh trams. <laughs> but perhaps the better, more important point to reflect on today is that on so many occasions in both minority government and in majority government, there have been cross-party support for social and economic change. For example, I think on February 2008, when the Liberal Democrats and the Greens voted with us to restore the principle of free higher education in Scotland. Or June 2009, when we passed the most ambitious climate change legislation of any country in the world, we had the support of every party in this chamber, including the Conservative Party. On March of this year, when Labour, Liberal Democrats and Greens joined with us to ensure that nobody need face eviction from their homes as a consequence of the bedroom tax. But most of all, uh, I think about the consistent and often joint endeavour against the headwinds of economic circumstance and austerity to make Scotland a stronger, fairer and more cohesive nation. Throughout my time as First Minister, I've heard it said by some in this place that the government's pursuit of national independence crowded out other issues, even that the Constitution was of little interest to Scotland. But that has not been the experience or the verdict of the people. We have all just lived through one of the most invigorating, extraordinary debates of the democratic era, one of the most impressive of any country, anywhere, at any time. It is argued that people everywhere have become disengaged from politics, not in Scotland in 2014. It is said that they no longer care about the, the business of governance, not in Scotland in 2014. In the last few months, we've watched an electorate passionately engaged in the, the business of fashioning their own future. I see little evidence that the people of Scotland resented the government pursuing that business with them and for them. It was considered of the Daily Record newspaper a consistent bulwark of this government over the last seven years to provide a, a poll today showing 50% SNP support on the very day I am leaving. <laughs> Mind you, it might be because I'm leaving. But it's a, wise, it's a wise newspaper that listens to the verdict of its readers. The more important realisation is this. We are on a, a political journey, and each step along the way has been dictated by the impact of the Constitution on issues which mean the most to ordinary Scots. This Parliament was reborn out of the realisation that we could no longer afford to have our domestic politics dictated by governments without democratic legitimacy. We progressed because people became impatient with politicians who wanted to administer rather than to govern. And we'll grow further yet because people wish to shape the circumstances around them and are demanding in a parliament fully equipped for that task. The last 12 months have been an extraordinary example of this nation's talents and capabilities. It's been a year of substantial economic progress. 50,000 people, more people are in employment in Scotland. We have a record total of women in employment in Scotland. There are figures showing inward investment at a 17-year high. We've hosted our year of homecoming, staged the Ryder Cup, and organised the greatest ever Commonwealth Games. And we've managed a referendum, which has been hailed around the world as a model of truly participative democracy. Scotland has a, a new sense of political confidence and a new sense of economic confidence. They are reinforcing each other. And wherever we travel and are travelling together as a nation, they are transforming this country for the better. Presenting officer, that new sense of political confidence, of engagement, is the point on which I wish to end. At the start of my speech, I mentioned the enthusiasm that was generated by the re-establishment of this parliament in 1999, when the MSPs were applauded into the Assembly Hall in the Mount. Fifteen years on, that applause has evolved into something much more meaningful, sustained, critical, constructive engagement involving people in every part of the country. Scotland now has the most energised, empowered, 
an informed electorate of any country in Europe. We have a, a new generation of citizens who understand that their opinion matters, who believe that their voice will be heard and who know that their vote can shape the society they live in. For all of us, that should be a point of pride, a source of challenge. Uh, for me, the sense of generational change has been a factor in deciding the time is right to move on from being First Minister. For this Parliament, it should spur us on to become even more accessible, uh, to serve the new expectations of the people. For everyone in public life, it should inspire us to involve, include and empower the electorate as we continue to quest to create a more prosperous and more equal Scotland. I wish each and every one of you well in pursuit of that endeavour. Uh, Presiding officer, it has been the privilege of my life to serve as First Minister for these last seven and a half years. Any parting is tinged with some sorrow, but in this case it is vastly outweighed by a sense of optimism and confidence. Confidence that we will have uh, an outstanding new First Minister. Confidence in the standing and the capability of this chamber. And most of all, confidence in the wisdom, the talent, the potential of the people of Scotland. Scotland has changed, changed utterly and much for the better over the 15 years of this parliament and over the seven years of this government. But I'm happy to say with every degree of certainty that more change and better days lie ahead for this parliament and for Scotland. Jack Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I congratulate the First Minister on his statement to this chamber and associate myself with much of what the First Minister said um, and thank him in particular for rec the, recognising those MSPs no longer with us. Presiding Officer, we are a young parliament and Alex Hammond has been First Minister for almost half of our lifetime. He and I have sparred, we've disagreed, we've fallen out, we've fought across the floor of this chamber and I've particularly enjoyed um, our own personal jousts at First Minister's questions. Can I thank him in particular for all the name checks that he has thrown my way because it's seriously done wonders for my profile. But do you know... It would be wrong of anyone, not least myself, not to recognise the commitment of the First Minister to Parliament and to public service. No one of any party is able to deny the First Minister's passion for Scotland or his love of his country. We know, though, that the First Minister also brought to bear, mainly on the opposition, but not always, his very significant political talents. The Scottish Parliament and Scottish politics in general need people of talent from whatever political persuasion, because that is how we improve our political debates and our institutions, and the First Minister's considerable abilities will be missed. We know, given his track record, though, that he might just emulate Arnold Schwarzenegger and proclaim that he will be back. I also know how much of a toll being an elected member just takes on family life, so I hope at least that the First Minister gets some time to spend with his wife Moira, and I wish you both well for the future. I could also have suggested, not that I would, that it would have given the First Minister more free time to play golf, but that's one thing that appears not to have been affected by the burdens of office. I also know, though, how proud the First Minister's father is of his son's achievements. Robert Salmond has been to the Parliament on a number of occasions, seen his son in action in the chamber, and I'm sure, presiding officer, that there could have been no prouder moment for Mr Salmond than to see his son elected as First Minister of Scotland. The First Minister has had a long and distinguished career, but it wasn't all plain sailing. 
Who knew that the First Minister was expelled from the SNP? Indeed, if anyone is so minded, you can catch this on YouTube, the First Minister marching out of SNP conference in Perth with, amongst others, Kenny McCaskill, Stuart Stevenson, Rosanna Cunningham, and, of course, the late Margot MacDonald. But a word of warning, that's 10 minutes out of your life that you will never get back. <laughs> But it didn't take the First Minister long before he was back in the fold and he took over leadership for the first time of his party. It will forever be a matter of record and for historians to write about that the First Minister took his party from relative political wilderness to minority government in 2007 in a relatively short period of time. Indeed, for the First Minister to then go on to achieve majority government is something that still has John Curtis scratching his head. The First Minister can be assured and rightly proud of his record as leader of his party. But there is no doubt that the single biggest issue to have dominated his term in office and the lifetime of the Parliament was the referendum campaign. Now, whatever side of the debate you were on, nobody can deny that it wasn't invigorating. Never should any politician ever be afraid of welcoming political engagement from whatever quarter that that may come. But all of us in this place, let's be honest, would love to see turnouts of the level experienced on the 18th of September. But you know, more than anything else, before we are SNP members, before we are Labour members, we are Democrats. And to see so many Scots participate was a genuinely heartening experience. That the First Minister has done the honourable thing and taken responsibility for that defeat is to his credit. That does seem only fair because, after all, as the First Minister apparently said on BBC Radio Scotland this morning, it could have never happened without him. But, presiding officer, the First Minister knows that I always like to be helpful. So I think I know where yes went wrong. After the First Minister's comments that he single-handedly would have prevented the crash of RBS, saving the entire world from an international banking crisis, surely it is clear to the SNP and everybody in this chamber, now if only the First Minister had been running the Yes campaign. <laughs> Presiding officer, I can understand Mr Salmon's disappointment, but you know you should take heart because it appears that the First Minister has started a bit of a trend with the 45ers. No, Presiding Officer, I am not referring to those in denial over the referendum result. I'm actually referring to the supporters of Keith Brown, who are telling all who will listen that he actually won, that the membership figures for Clackmannanshire and Dunblane SNP are now on a par with the population of China. <laughs> Presiding Officer, I understand that the First Minister is writing a book, and I will rush out to secure my copy. He is apparently promising some surprising revelations. Will he reveal that he has eventually found the missing EU legal advice? What about a crumpled up receipt for some swanky American hotel? Who knows? Who knows? He might even get some writing tips from his biographer, David Torrance. He knows him, the guy off the telly, not quite sure who he is, but I understand the First Minister writes about him regularly. But last week, I asked the First Minister to describe himself in one word. Now, none of us were surprised when he suggested that that was wholly inadequate um, for a man of his considerable talents. And I agree, because such considerable talents that monuments are, as we speak, being erected to pay tribute to his time as First Minister. Now, I know that that sounds you know, interesting to many, um, a standing stone in Edinburgh being erected to celebrate Alex Salmond. Um, I never knew we had such celebrity in our Miss Presiding Officer, but perhaps of more interest, who knows who was the kind benefactor. Whatever happens, I am sure we have not heard the last of, from Alex Salmond, and neither have the listeners to radio. The big question on everyone's lips, when will we hear from Alec from Stricken again? But if rumours are true, Alex's colleagues in Westminster will be hearing a lot of him in due course. The First Minister has never been lacking in ambition for Scotland, but he moves now on to pastures new, and I do genuinely wish him well in his future career. 
quite what the new deputy leader of the SNP, Stuart Hosey, will make of Alex returning to Westminster is unknown. Or indeed the leader of the SNP in Westminster, Angus Robertson. But they needn't worry because Alex Hammond will leave them well behind. His ambition is, of course, to be the Deputy Prime Minister. But as the First Minister steps back from the front bench to the back benches to contemplate his future place in history, history both of the Scottish Parliament and of Scotland is assured. He has, without doubt, been a towering figure in Scottish politics for a decade and more. He has been Scotland's longest serving First Minister. And I thank him for his service to this Parliament and to the country. I want to close, Presiding Officer, by repeating a line from our national anthem that could be about our departing First Minister. No, Presiding Officer, it's not that we sent him home to think again, but perhaps more apt, when will we see your likes again? Thank you. Thank you. I now call Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I add my own best wishes and those of my party to the First Minister today as he leaves office? It's traditional at this point that I should now also add a few words about how enjoyable retirement is, how pleasant the golf course looks. But seeing as there seems absolutely no chance of that Alex Hammond is actually going to retire, I'll leave that to one side for the moment. It is said that all political careers end in failure, except Alex Salmon's. He is the archetypal Teflon Don, whose career doesn't appear ever to actually finish. Claims to lead the SNP to 20 seats in 2010 actually saw a, a drop from seven MPs to six. Boasts of taking Glasgow City Council in 2012 and claiming three MEPs in the summer of 2014 all died at the ballot box, but still the juggernaut rumbled on. He is a political Lazarus, railing against a Westminster elite that he's been part of not once but twice and after May could return to for a third time. No doubt Nicola Sturgeon doesn't want a backseat driver directing traffic from the sub-ledge committee here in Holyrood. But regardless of whether this is an end or merely a, a brief pit stop before Mr Salmon's next lap of the political track, let me today pay tribute and pass comment on the First Minister's period in office. And let me start by touching on where I began. Because if there's one thing that we can all recognise that distinguishes Mr Salmon from many other of his contemporaries is that quite remarkable longevity. When I was elected Conservative Party leader, he kindly called me to offer his congratulations and quickly said, excuse me for asking, but how old are you? Uh, and when I answered, he quite wistfully replied, ah, I was 35 when I first led my party. And what a contribution he has made to that party. To many people, for many years, he simply was the SNP. The pressures of leadership are immense, and to have served two decades at the helm and more than seven years as First Minister is a feat of enormous stamina, of willpower and of discipline. There are, I believe, very few people who are capable of it. What has also distinguished him has been the way that he has stuck to his course for all that time. Reading Mr Salmon's maiden speech to the House of Commons from 1987 is to look back to a different era. But there he is, as if it was yesterday, moaning about the Scottish Tories, aiming a low blow at the Labour Party for failing to take us on, and banging on about the Constitution. <laughs> uh, if sometimes he may appear like a stuck record, the truth is, is that it is because Alex Salmon has stuck to the same tune over such a long period of time that, like an earworm, the lyrics have been retained in people's brains. <laughs> We on this side of the chamber may not have agreed with him very often, but it is unusual to find a politician who, for nigh on three decades, has relentlessly made the same case over and over again. And we would be churlish not to recognise the belief, the persistence and the stamina that that takes. But it is as First Minister today that he is resigning, and it is his record as First Minister that Scotland will ultimately decide his legacy. And the record, I believe, is mixed. I believe that for simplicity's sake, it can be neatly divided into a game of two halves. In his first term, from 2007 to 2011, Mr Salmon's minority status ensured that he had to gain consensus and reach out to other parties for support. And the fact that sceptical Scottish voters were worried about a nationalist administration meant that Mr Salmon had sometimes to tone things down. Sometimes he appeared to have declawed himself, maybe counted to 20 every time he was about to say something about independence. 
and focused on mouthing lots of po positive but sometimes vague statements on progress. Ever the populist, he saw better than any of his predecessors how public funds could be used to win support among key target voters. Hence, early decisions to cancel bridge tolls, scrap university tuition fees and prescription charges. We even worked with them to bring forward a number of other policies, a thousand extra police officers, a fund to regenerate our town centres, a new drug strategy for Scotland. There could be no doubt across Scotland that we now had a government which looked and sounded like it knew what it was doing, even if you didn't much like sometimes what that was. And the result was that, despite not having a parliamentary majority, no party sought to try and bring the SNP government down during that first four years. On Thursday, the First Minister joked to my Labour and Liberal colleagues that working with the Conservatives was electoral suicide, despite the small matter of us having defeated him at the recent referendum. Despite also, I believe, one of the reasons for his administration gaining a reputation for competence and stability during those first four years was because he needed, he sought and he received support from the Scottish Conservatives to pass his budget and keep his government on the rails. One might say that the First Minister and Annabel Goldie stood shoulder to shoulder to make the government work. I wouldn't go so far as to say that they were better together, but such a close working relationship was no drag to his electoral prospects in 2011. So if that was the first half, we are all too aware of the second. With that remarkable majority, the referendum on independence was agreed, and I believe it's a tribute to both Scottish and UK governments that it was done so with good faith on both sides. And it is from then on that I believe Mr Salmon's record will be judged, perhaps not just quite as kindly, by some. I do not begrudge Alex Salmon for devoting the Scottish Government's time and energy to campaigning for independence. That was his right and his democratic mandate. Rather in time, I believe questions may be asked over the way in which Alex Salmon fought that campaign. I believe that there was another case that could have been made, a case that accepted and acknowledged upheaval that separating our United Kingdom would have caused, an acknowledgement that some things would be worse, at least in the short term. And Alex Salmon could have used his powerful political and communication skills to have argued that all of that notwithstanding, the goal of a fully sovereign Scotland was worth it. Now, I'm not saying that our own campaign was perfect, and indeed not. What I am saying is that it was the First Minister who had ultimate responsibility for setting out to people the facts about independence. And on that crucial task, I'm afraid he came up short. His decision to resign immediately after the referendum was an honourable one. And I believe many of us here have, however, greatly enjoyed the salmon unleashed we've had since, the greening letters, the radio show phone-ins and the opening supermarkets out of peak. But if we remember, on the day that he took over as the First Minister in May 2007, Alex Salmon said, and I quote, the Parliament will be one in which the Scottish Government relies on the merits of its legislation, not the might of a parliamentary majority. The Parliament will be about compromise and concession, intelligent debate and mature discussion. Inevitably, given the passions raised by the independence referendum, it has not been easy to maintain those noble ambitions. However, Mr Salmond has led a government which has often tried to do so, and for that he deserves great credit. I agree with Mr Salmond that this parliament has indeed become the centre of gravity for Scottish politics, and for that too, he and his team deserves our regard. This parliament's stature is now recognised by all. We are all committed to ensuring that far greater powers and responsibilities are passed to this place. And he can leave today in the knowledge that he has taken his party from the fringes to a position of enormous strength. His leadership has been characterised by a remarkable instinct for the exercise of power. It kept him at the top of his party for two decades, it brought him to the top of Scottish political life, and it made him a dominant politician of this era. And I find myself, presiding officer, in a remarkable position. I stand before you today as possibly one of those rarest of breeds, an opposition leader in the Scottish Parliament who appears to have outlasted Alex Salmond. That is, of course, unless he decides to come back. On the assumption that he doesn't, can I once again extend my very best wishes to him, to Moira and to his wider family today. Thank you. Well, any... uh, last week, the First Minister said he had quoted the wrong general when he rejected appeals to return as leaders of his party back in 2004. Apparently, he meant to quote General MacArthur with, I shall return. 
MacArthur made the remark upon arrival in Australia following a harrowing escape from Corregidor to organise the offensive against Japan in 1942. The paths of the First Minister and mine have crossed occasionally. I don't know if he remembers, but we first met in the Bridge Cafe in Kincardine on polling day in the Dunfermline by-election, when he confidently predicted that he was going to win at that by-election. Less than a week later, I am sure, I'm sure it was cheering, that I heard him cheering in the Commons when I took my seat, being <laughs> sworn in that day. A stark reminder to the First Minister that winning is not the sole preserve of his party, and that just like General MacArthur, we shall return too. <laughs> <laughs> the original statement that the First Minister actually made in 2004, if drafted, I will not run, if nominated, I will not accept, if elected, I will not serve, comes from the Sherman Pledge, a remark made by the American Civil War General Sherman when he was being considered as a possible Republican candidate for presidential election in 1884. A variation was crafted a century later. Democratic Congressman Mo Udall of Arizona was asked if he would run in 1984 against President Ronald Reagan. Udall responded, if nominated, I shall run to Mexico. <laughs> if elected, I shall fight extradition. I can guarantee that if the First Minister wants to follow suit, I can promise we will not seek his extradition. He will certainly not be part of any new fresh talent initiative. <laughs> Alex Salmond sat behind me on the green benches for four years, offering words of encouragement. I have been returning the favour from this seat ever since. <laughs> I can now let him into a secret. I listened to him in Westminster as much as he appears to have listened to me here. <laughs> but to be fair, after my proposals for investing in nursery education for two-year-olds were repeatedly dismissed by the First Minister, he did finally accept that I was right after all. The First Minister has attracted many names during his tenure, some not suitable for this chamber. I am sure he will reject this comparison, and I say this to pull his tail but he's a bit like Margaret Thatcher, a, mar a Marmite figure with his supporters as passionate as his detractors. His lasting legacy will be almost securing independence for Scotland in the biggest democratic experience of all our lifetimes. On the one hand, it attracted the highest turnout in any election for decades, and for some, it was uplifting and engaging. But on the other hand, it was far from a universal experience. For too many families, friends and communities, the referendum was divisive. He may not wish to accept it, but that will be as much his legacy as all the positive attributes that he would describe. It will take many years for those wounds to heal and the unity we once enjoyed to return. I hope he reflects on that in his retirement. With his resignation today, a mantle passes from him to me. Ruth Davidson pointed out that I was now the longest serving party leader with the privilege of regularly quizzing the First Minister. Not by long, but I'll take any prizes these days. <laughs> that I spend Thursday mornings honing and crafting the 200 words to deploy each week is a credit to the standards he has set for First Minister's questions. And that he has been so relaxed about providing answers each week also reflects his political ability. I was grateful for the kind words he offered when I returned from my back operation last week. In the same spirit, I hope the First Minister's arm is healing. As the new veteran leader, can I offer some advice to the departing First Minister? We all need to take care of our health. I intend to get back running as soon as possible. I would encourage the First Minister to spend some time with his beloved golf clubs. I am sure I speak for many that he should take his frustrations out on inanimate golf balls rather than opposition politicians. <laughs> to lead a government and a country is a privilege and an honour. It can, I imagine, at times be an ordeal. Every remark analysed, every move studied, every posture photographed. I think we can all recognise that and the personal commitment that Alex Salmond has made. I wish him well for the future. Yeah.
Patrick Harvey. Nothing lasts forever, said Francis Urquhart. <laughs> even, even the longest, most glittering reign must come to an end. Well, Alex Salmon's tenure as First Minister has certainly been long by the standards of the office. And while his supporters might have called it glittering, and his critics might compare his record with the worst misdeeds of Francis Urquhart, the truth, to be honest, is probably somewhere in between. And I'm sure Mr Salmon's backbenchers will understand if all opposition leaders feel the need to reflect on some of the lows as well as the highs. I'll start with a low so that I can end on a high. I hope that's forgivable. And I've chosen a low point which allows me to insult somebody other than the First Minister. I hope that's also agreeable, because he may already regret ever falling into the orbit of Donald Trump. A First Minister of Scotland should always try to recognise the distinctive Scottish values, which surely embrace an egalitarian approach to life, to enter into dealings with a man who embodies the values of me, 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 more, 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 greed and overconsumption, nothing so much as the nauseating values of Tea Party America. Such dealings could never have ended well. What I find bewildering is that the Scottish Government seems about to repeat those mistakes on the other side of the country. So I ask the First Minister to take this last opportunity, perhaps his last act uh, before he leaves office, finally to sever all links with this delusional bully. I fear if he doesn't, uh, not only his successor, but the rest of the country too will come to regret it. OK, so on to the high point. No doubt some would expect me to cite the Climate Change Act, the moment when Holyrood agreed without a single dissenting vote to set clear and binding emission targets. Well, it was a moment to remember, but it was only a half measure of consensus. We agreed on the goal, but never how it was to be achieved. So the high point I would credit Alex Salmond with in this area, the important contribution I want to recognise on this occasion is not on a target, but on an idea. By putting his personal weight behind the concept of climate justice, he helped to advance an argument which is only going to grow in its global importance in the debate on climate change. For a wealthy country, a country which contributed greatly to the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution which followed, a country which benefited from the carbon age, and sadly, which has still not broken its perilous dependence on the production of fossil fuels. For such a country to argue that clean, sustainable, low-carbon economic development must be linked to justice between rich and poor, and to the human rights of those least responsible for climate change, but most acutely affected by it, and by the damage we have done and continue to do, this was an important argument to make. Alex Salmond used the office of First Minister to advance that argument, and he's due great credit for doing so. Mr Salmond brings his tenure as First Minister to an end after a referendum which has changed Scottish politics irreversibly. It did not lead to the change we both sought, though at 45% the level of support for independence was certainly higher than many had predicted at the start of that long campaign. The case was advanced, and I don't believe that it will retreat from that point. If and when Scotland ever comes to ask itself that question again, it will do so from a more developed starting point, with few remaining doubts from any part of the political spectrum that Scotland has what it takes to be a successful independent country. It may be that too narrow an emphasis was placed on one particular vision of independence, one book of answers. That may be a lesson for another time. For now, though the vote went against the Yes campaign, the experience has been transformational. The re-engagement with politics, the spectacular turnout, the channeling of understandable and justifiable anger with a broken political system into something constructive and positive, a movement for change. These are things that Alex Salmond did help to bring, a, bring about, and indeed it is possible they could not have happened without him. I believe, presiding officer, that Scotland has been trying to vote for change for a long time now, in creating this parliament, in bringing new voices into it, in trying out coalition, minority and majority government, and then finally in testing this question of independence at the polling stations. That urge to change our politics, to build something better, that will stay with us. And I have no doubt that Alex Salmond will continue to play a significant part, whether here or elsewhere, 
in ways which inspire his supporters and infuriate its critics in equal measure. I thank him for his service to Parliament and to the country. Stuart Stevenson. Alexander Elliott. Anderson Salmon was born to privilege. Not the privilege of rank, not the privilege of money, not the privilege of connections, but the overwhelming privilege of being a black bitch. That, of course, for those who don't understand that, is the appellation for people who are born in Linlithgow. And the black bitch that is on the town's uh, crest carries beneath it the motto Fidelis, faithfulness. And Alec has been a faithful servant of this parliament and of this country. He was born with the privilege of caring and nurturing parents, the privilege of a free education to liberate his potential, the foundations of his ambitions for all our people. From day one, he was a disruptive influence. Being born on Hogmanay, he could hardly be otherwise. The parties were somewhat subdued on that particular day. He's been a potent agent for change. His life has been and will remain in the public gaze, but not everything's known. So... <laughs> Alec, his sons will do, left the family home. His mother Mary breathed a great sigh of relief. A certain calm fell over 101 Preston Road, Linlithgow. But it was actually going to be a few years before Alec finally departed. His mother, fed up with his still occupying an entire room in the house, moved all his political impedimenta he'd accumulated in its many boxes and disorder into the front garden. She phoned him to remind them that she lived a mere 300 metres from Linlithgow's recycling centre. Strangely, the garden was soon restored to its natural order and Mary and Robert had the room in their house back. So, when we read his autobiography, and I have the money waiting here now, First Minister, remember its genesis in that front garden. His grandfather was a wonderful storyteller who equipped him with that ability to construct a story, to tell the story, and to seize the imagination. In May 1961, John F. Kennedy committed his country to land a man on the moon before the decade was out and return them safely to Earth. It wasn't known that it could be done. It wasn't known how it would be done, but he knew that it had to be done. And Alec comes from that mould, a formidable leader, a formidable challenger of the status quo, a man who sets the rest of us formidable challenges. He's the toughest boss I've ever worked for or with, and the fairest, and a team builder. But however tough he's been on me, or tough on the rest of us, he's always been tougher on himself. A driven man building on the achievements of our previous three First Ministers, he's raised the bar still further for our next First Minister, raised the bar for Nicola. He's always been conscious that we're all here, Parliament, office life, for but a short passage of time, and hence that everything is about people. And for me, there are two events illustrate that. In the referendum, and an echo from a previous campaign. Some 15 years earlier, when I was driving him around Scotland, yes, I used to be Alex Salmon's driver, we came up this incline and we found someone lying in the middle of the road with a beating heart but a tortured mind. Alec was first out of that car to help that person in their distress. Our plans for the day were put on hold until we returned them to their family and he'd listened to their story, and he'd offered help. Not a thought for his personal safety on a busy road or for the day's political objectives. During the referendum campaign, so recently passed, the most telling moment for me, if perhaps not for others, 
was when he met a young man who came up to him and explained politely that he was voting no. Now, Alec didn't seek to belittle that young man. He softly regretted the decision he'd made, but he shook his hand, he held his hand, he listened to that man. If we learn anything from Alec, it is that we must listen, perhaps especially to those with views differing from our own, however much we don't want to hear them. But of course, whatever we say this afternoon, whatever we say to Alec, uh, we speak of transition, not of an ending. FMQs will, of course, be different, and Nicola will put her own stamp on that as Scotland's new leader. We'll miss your irritated flick behind the right ear when you judge that the question from the benches on the left is more inadequate than usual. We shall miss your careful checking of the wallet in the hip pocket when you've had a question from the benches on your right. <laughs> we shall miss your checking that your jacket pocket flaps are out as you remember your spouse's commands for the day. <laughs> Let me say to you, Alec, our First Minister, perhaps the last time I shall address him thus, whatever the future may hold, take from all of us our good wishes, our thanks and our love. First Minister. Well, uh, briefly, and I promise uh, uh, briefly, uh, pre presiding officer, uh, Jackie, uh, 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 small corrections. Saving the world was Gordon Brown, not me. Uh, they, 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 it wasn't in Perth that I was expelled from the party. It was in air at the, the Dam Park Pavilion. Uh, and you're wrong. Your YouTube, uh, go and look at it again. I did not walk out. I was flung out. <laughs> I, I, I merely offer you this just in case you're ever in that position. Never go willingly. <laughs> Wait to be expelled, Jackie. But I actually thought, you know, I thought the rocks would melt with the sun before Jackie Bailey said something nice about me. But I was wrong, she did. And I thank her for that and thank her for her contribution uh, in terms of First Minister's questions over these last few weeks. Ruth Davidson... I had no idea you were so close to voting for independence. <laughs> you were on the very cusp. If only we had found the argument in the right way to take you over the finishing line. Uh, and I was so delighted to, to discover that the achievements of implementing SNP policy between 2007 and 2011 were actually the achievements of the Conservative Party. Uh, uh, well, can I just say, since you mentioned Annabel Goldie, uh, that somewhere... Somewhere uh, there is a, a, a video of, uh, of me doing a toast to the lasses and Annabel doing a reply at the Scout and Guide Association of just a few years ago. Thankfully, due to a series of injunctions, interdicts and super interdicts, <laughs> Annabel and I acting together have managed to keep that off YouTube uh, for the time being. If it ever does emerge... Uh, then we'll both have to stay in retirement, I fear. Uh, Willie Rennie, that thing about telling you the SNP were going to win the, the by-election in that cafe, I thought you were a voter, Willie. I didn't recognise you. <laughs> I have no doubt that the Liberal Democrats will return, Willie. I'm just not quite certain what you'll return to. That's it. <laughs> Uh, Patrick, I, I, I listened with, with great care. I, I was still left hanging as to whether I was closer to Francis Urquhart or to Donald Trump. Uh, but can I just say that uh, I've always regarded you and your interventions in the term of a critical friend. And I actually thank you for both of these aspects. Uh, and I thank you for your, your remarks uh, today. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Well, uh, Stuart, of course, is right. Uh, a black bitch is a term of huge praise uh, uh, in Linlivgo. It means born within the, the, the sound of St Michael's bells. But it does 
confirmed just about everything my political opponents have ever thought about me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stuart, can I just say you're wrong about the uh, Hogmanay celebrations in uh, 1954. My, my dad went off to the Hearts Hibs match. <laughs> it was the same for some considerable time thereafter. Uh, but Stuart Stevenson is, uh, has been my friend and colleague for nigh on 40 years. I, I hope that we can do another 40 years together, uh, Stuart, and I, I thank you for your remarks today. Presenting officer, uh, through you, can I wish every single one, every member of this parliament well, uh, and through you, wish everyone goodbye and good luck. <laughs>